Let me begin uh, by looking at uh, Christ's approach to uh, community work. Whenever Jesus um, wanted to make a point, he often told a story. And one of his most famous stories is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now, can anybody tell me a little bit about what that's about? Like, for example, when was that set? What, what point was that set in? Um, <laughs> yeah, so set, set in the day of judgment uh, at the future, like at the end of history, isn't it? Okay. And, um, and it, it, it envisages Jesus as, as the human one who has come back to judge humanity. Okay? Is that right? All right. Now, what's this bit about the sheep and goats? What's, what's that got to do with that particular story? What does he say about the sheep and goats? Who are they? What do they represent? People and the choices they make. Okay, great. The sheep and the goats represent people and the choices that they make. Um, and don't forget this was a Middle Eastern context. It's not Australia or New Zealand where you can tell easily the difference between a sheep and goats. In that context, it's very hard to tell the difference between sheep and goats. From a distance, you can't tell. They look the same. And that's a really important part of this story. It's about separating people based on their, the choices that they make um, that don't immediately look very different or seem very different. The, the differences aren't, aren't necessarily immediately observable. right? So it's set at the day of judgment. Jesus comes back as the human one to judge humanity and he, he separates people into two categories based on their choices. Um, who are the sheep and who are the goats? Who do they represent? What kind of choices do they represent? Sheep served and care and look out for others. And the goats Don't. didn't. Yes, that's right. Uh, they said but. So they're not actually... Uh, <laughs> that's what distinguishes them from the, from the sheep. So, okay, that's so the sheep are the good guys and the, the goats are the bad guys. That's right? Yeah, in the story, isn't it? Yeah, so it separates. Now, what is, what is the criteria that Jesus uses for um, making his decision about separating these people into good guys and bad guys? How they treated the least. Not the okay. People around them. Exactly. So the criteria Jesus uses at the end of history for his judgment, uh, when he's making judgments about people, um, as to whether they were good or bad, is how they treated the least. That's right. Now, I think that's quite fascinating. I mean, how do we explain this? Isn't God concerned about everybody? Why doesn't he say, look, the criteria should be about how you treated everybody. Right? If you were nice to everybody, it's okay. If you weren't nice to everybody, that's not okay. Now, isn't God committed equally to everybody? Wouldn't that make sense that that would be the criteria? Why, do, when Jesus comes back to judge the world, does he say, the crucial issue is the way you have treated the least? Why does he do that? What sense do you make of that? How is that just? Well, Sorry? Okay, so you're saying it's how we treated the majority of the people and the majority of the people in the world are poor, hungry, homeless. Okay, there's a degree of legitimacy to that. The difficulty is, it's not everybody, is it? So, where is the justice in that? I guess we, we treat everyone around us who are similar to us quite well, but it's the, it's the really poor people or the really needy people that... We don't get down to... Okay, so you're just... It, so you're saying it's not just a matter of that there's, they may form the majority of people. Our treatment of that m majority mm. is an indicator of our values. That, in fact, um, they are the test of whether, in fact, we are really relating well to everybody uh, because they test how we relate to that particular group. Yeah, we're, not, we're good at 90% maybe, but... And why is that so important? Because we don't love 
love everyone. Right. Yeah, and that's the whole point. That's the whole point. God loves everybody equally. He's concerned about the way we relate to everyone. And he is particularly concerned about those that we are not particularly concerned for. Is that clear? So he actually says that the criteria that he will use to judge us is based on his concern for his love for everybody. But he's particularly concerned about those people that are normally left out in our general regard for the welfare of everybody, right? Now, in this story, he begins to unpack different descriptors of those kind of people that we tend to ignore, tend to neglect, tend to reject. What are some of the descriptors that he uses of those people? What is their predicament? They're hungry. So they're hungry. So, naked. Yes? Naked. They're naked. They're thirsty, they're in prison, they're sick. That's right. So the interesting thing I think about this is that Jesus isn't actually using a class analysis. He doesn't actually use the language of the poor here. It's not poor as opposed to the rich. His, his descriptors really are people who cannot access basic needs. And those people may be rich or they may be poor. In fact, I'd like to suggest to you that there are the least from the very top to the very bottom of society. Is that clear? Who are some of the least at the top of society who cannot access their basic needs that might fit this category of the least that Jesus is concerned about? Thirsty ones. <laughs> who are always aware that there's something missing, that there's something that is not satisfying in their lives. That may be true. But don't forget, this, he's actually using a physical language here. About, yeah. yeah. So it may be true metaphorically. The mentally impaired. That's right. So you're starting to look at people who actually do not have the capacity to engage intellectually, um, who are psychiatrically disturbed, people who may be abused, people who may be subject to domestic violence, right? <coughs> people who may be addicted, Disrupted. right? may be disabled, and those people are from the top to the bottom of society, right? right? They're there everywhere, in every church, in every community. Those that most of us consider least. Is that clear? Yep. Having said that, however, where are most of the people that most consider least? At the top or at the bottom? At the bottom, yes. So in fact, uh, if we were to draw a, a diagram here, say, of... Uh, the world and these are the, the rich, these are the upper middle class, these are the middle middle class, here's the lower, uh, sorry, lower middle class, um, here's the underclass, okay, and this is the rest. You've probably got few of the people at the top who are among the least, but the majority of those people uh, who are the least are among the poorest of the poor, right? Now, it's very interesting that, um, that Jesus would seem to suggest that on the day of judgment, we're going to be judged for the weight that we relate to the least. Because generally, if you look at the distribution of Christian workers in the world, where are they? At which level do we find, say, in places like Australia and New Zealand, where are most of the trained Christian workers? At which level? At which level? Middle. Yeah, I reckon, I reckon from there upwards, that's where most of us are. Why is that? Because they can afford us. Because they can afford us. No, that is, that is exactly right. They can actually pay for our salaries. That is significant. That is highly significant. Right? Um, which is why Jesus says you can only serve God or mammon, but not both. If you allow money to be the determining factor, you will not reflect the priorities of God. Do, do you understand that? It's very clearly. Um, the, the other reason is that we have a career path within Christian groups and organisations that reflects and reinforces the dominant values. So even if you start out 
with a poor group of people in a struggling church. As you develop your knowledge and skills, you become more uh, upwardly mobile. And, a, and a, a bigger and a better church takes you on. And so, in fact, uh, not only are the majority of Christian workers up in that section, but anybody that starts out here tends and does well, tends to move up and away from those people. And so then we've got people, the whole modelling in our culture, not in the, just our general culture, but our religious culture, is not towards these people, but away from them. When you get crazy groups like ser servants coming along and saying, oh, we've got to be with the poor, we've got to work along with the poor, you go, yeah, but how many people have you got in your mission? <laughs> right? Hardly anybody. Right? Because nobody in their right mind wants to go and do that kind of stuff. Right? We've gone to university, we've been to seminary, we've developed our knowledge and skills. We want to sell our, uh, you know, our capacity to the highest bidder. I mean, do you understand that? Huh? So there's this, so there's a constant movement away from those people that need us most. Is, is that, is that true? Yeah. Now, I would like to suggest that if we're going to um, actually do what Christ wants us to do and, and engage the world at large in a way that reflects his love, but particularly the people that are most marginalised and disadvantaged, that we need to be converted all over again. Hmm? <laughs> Let me explain what I mean. Okay. These are categories that you may be familiar with. Who do we tend to put first? Just generally. Ourselves. That's right. Who do we put tend to put last? Others. Okay. So we become a Christian. Now we know we're meant to actually concert, be, to care for others. Who do we tend to put first among the others? And then who do we tend to put last? Those yes, those that we relate to. So people that are like us. Um, so either are like us or do like us. <laughs> right? <laughs> the ones that it's easier for us to relate to. So, yeah. And we develop whole schools of mission around that. Kind of homogeneous church growth, for example. Okay. So, uh, and then we relate to people that are not like us last or who don't like us. <laughs> All right? Is that right? But say we get filled with the Spirit, okay, right? We, and, and we're no longer a nice middle-of-the-road evangelical Christian. Now we're a super-duper charismatic or Pentecostal Christian, okay? And now we are going to go for it and we're going to relate to these people who don't like us, right? And who are not like us, right? Um, and a lot of the mission in the world today is coming out of charismatic and Pentecostal groups, crossing those divides. Who do we tend to relate to first out of that group? And who do we tend to relate to last? Those we can make like us. <laughs> Thank you. Those that we can make like us. So, so that, that's very good. So the, let me just slightly change the language. The people that we feel hopeful about... Um, and so we get whole um, uh, schools of mission around responsive populations, right? So we invest with the hope that we'll get a return of our, on our time and energy and money, right? Is that right? And the ones we relate to last are the hopeless. The people Jesus called the least. Now, we may, as evangelical Christians and charismatic Christians, have those people on our agenda. The reality is, when it comes to operating, more often than not, we just never get around to relating to them. Because they're not our priority. We'd like to help if we could, but we just never have the time or energy or money to do it. Right? Do you know, understand what I'm saying? What Jesus calls us to do is to put the last first and the first last. Are you familiar with that terminology? 